Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is our third PD in the series. Today, we're going to be talking about supporting ongoing changes in student thinking, um, our ambitious science teaching practice three. Uh, today, you are only going to have me and Lillian, Craig, and the other uh, Kirsty and Inyoung are in another PD. So today, it's just us two. Uh, it looks like we have a small group today. We are glad you are here and can join us. If you have not already done so, um, please change your name your to your last name, first name, your grade level in the content area, science content area. Lillian has and will continue to put the link into the sign-in in our chat. And you will get a copy of this deck that we're presenting as well as the teacher deck that you'll present to your teachers. So uh, hold on to that, hold on for that. Um, again, if you have not signed in, go ahead and do so and change your name. We will go ahead and get started. So our kind of wake up activity today is um, Think about which TV teacher you're feeling like today. So if you, hopefully you can recognize most of these teachers. Um, don't enter yet, press enter yet. We're gonna waterfall chat this. So do you feel like Ferris Bueller? <laughs> Ferris Bueller's teacher. Um, is it recess? Number three, Breaking Bad. Number four, SpongeBob SquarePants. Number five, Glee. Six is our magic school bus. Number seven is Boy Meets World, eight is New Girl, and nine is Key and Peel. So go ahead and decide which teacher from which TV series do you feel, have you been feeling like lately? <laughs> and when you are ready, go ahead and press enter. <laughs> Key and Peel. <laughs> We've got Ferris Bueller. <laughs> That monotone voice. Okay, we have some SpongeBob teachers, some energetic teachers. New girl, she's an energetic teacher. And Magic School Bus, so is Miss Frindle, right? Is it Frindle? It's Frindle, right? <laughs> All right, thank you so much for sharing. Um, in our previous elementary PD, one of the teachers also said Ferris Bueller's Day Off and said, kids just aren't listening right now. <laughs> it might just be that time of the year. <clears throat> Thank you so much for sharing. Okay, so here are our objectives and outcomes for today. As engaged participants, we want to ensure that um, we understand that why the activity makes sense to do at certain points in the unit that we are going to be going through. We want to help students to bridge the activity with a larger scientific idea, right, that anchoring phenomenon, and to support the development of students' academic language using the activity as a context. So everything's coming back to this activity. How are they learning from it? What does it add and build on to? Just some of our online norms. We are in... Um, this is your attendance, and per, even though we're not in person, uh, we would like you to be engaged, um, muted when necessary, unmuted when asked, um, have your videos on if you can, uh, chat and discuss when prompted, and we might use some cold call if we have some too long of a silence. <laughs> we'll give you thinking time, but maybe sometimes it's a little too long. Um, as you're aware and have seen this before, these lavender slides um, will be facilitation notes for us as the trainers, for you as the, as the trainers. So you, it'll indicate that these are facilitator roles like this slide. And then the white slides will be indicating the learner slides, what you will be presenting to your teachers. So anytime we see these purple slides, it'll be a chance for us to discuss the previous chunk that we went through and think about some of the ways that we might need to adjust or some situations and concerns that might come up. 
We've seen these instructional levers before for this school year. Um, we have been looking at deep clarity of learning goals. Um, we've been looking at building our precision of pedagogy and shifting our practice now in high capacity building. So all three of these foci um, are really based in on student voice. What are we doing as teachers, as science teachers, leaders to build up our student voice, to build up their, their ability to have this discourse and communication? And um, how is what we're doing and learning as teachers really adding to that? We have here the basics of NGSS standards-based instruction. So we know that they live in these three dimensions. First, we have our DCIs or disciplinary core ideas. There needs to be at least one of these, what, what the students are trying to figure out. We then have our science and engineering practices or SEPs. How are the students trying to figure this out? What are they going to do? And then of course, our cross-cutting concepts um, how are students thinking about the science? This is the lens that they're thinking through, cause and effect, et cetera. And of course, all of this is based on why the students are trying to figure this out. They're anchoring phenomena and the storylines, um, not just a separate one and done sort of a concept or lesson, but really a connection to build up on all of these things. So we've seen this storyline um, before. We always talk about how the anchoring phenomenon is used as the backbone of a unit to form this story where students are engaged in multiple lessons and learning activities, investigative phenomenon to construct knowledge and develop an explanation. So initially they might have an initial model or an explanation. It could be oversimplified and short, but um, students, we want to encourage them to demonstrate their thinking as best as they can, even if they don't know it, know why, right? And that's okay. Over the process, over these lessons, they're going to build on that knowledge. They're going to make sense of things. They're going to uh, build on their thinking. And eventually we want to give them opportunities to revise their initial thinking by uh, looking at what they've learned so far and continue to add on. So that in the end, we come to this gapless explanation where they're really explaining um, explaining their answer to this anchor phenomenon. Of course, we know that our LDE science foci, we're looking at three main student moves of how students are figuring this out. Looking at SEP2, developing and using models, SCP-6, Constructing Explanations and Designing Solutions, and then SCP-7, Engaging in Argumentation for Evidence. And you'll see that common thread, as usual, of our claim, evidence, reasoning. And we as teachers, now how are we going to help our students figure these things out? We are going to be practicing these four ambitious science teaching practices. We've talked about planning for engagement with the big science ideas. Um, how we might elicit these students' ideas at the very beginning of a unit, and then now supporting ongoing changes in thinking. That's where we're really going to be building up on today. If you have not, uh, if you were not able to join us for PD one or two, you can view the videos using the links on the slides right here. Um, they correlate with each of our ambitious science teaching practices. And today, as mentioned, we're going to be talking about how we can support ongoing changes in thinking. So the revisions, the, the thinking through after we've given students opportunities to learn and build on that learning. So those slides are probably very familiar to you by now. Um, this is our first facilitation slide. What are some of these key points we want to make sure to highlight with this activity? What are some logistical or planning issues to consider when facilitating this activity? And what are some alternate protocols you might use for this activity and why? Um, in addition, what are some possible teacher responses or potential challenges to consider when planning for this? So we are going to go into our breakout rooms and you're gonna get three, three to four minutes to uh, go ahead and discuss these.
questions. And then when we come back, we will share out. I'm going to pass this on to Lillian now. Okay. Thank you, Erica. So um, we're going to start off with a sense making activity and we're going to put a participant slide deck in the chat where you'll be analyzing some activities and seeing um, if they are sense making activities and then also identifying if the oh, thank you, Erica, identifying what science and engineering practices the students might be engaged in. And um, so you're getting two links. The first is your participant slide deck that you can um, take a closer look at and read through those activities. And then the second link is the NGSS progressions. So you can have a discussion around why each activity was or was not a sense-making activity. Then you're gonna discuss um, and see if you can identify what science and engineering practices were uh, the students were able to engage in while participating in that activity. And see what elements you can find that kind of match up or pair up with that within those progressions. So any questions? I think, does everyone access the participant slide deck? So I think, um, Eric, if you want, go to the next slide really quickly before we send them off. So you're gonna be looking at learning activity one and learning activity two. Okay, and we're going, we'll be in the same breakout rooms for um, I think also for about four minutes. Hey, welcome back everyone. I hope you had an opportunity to review both activities and identify whether you thought it was a sense-making activity or not. So let's look at learning activity one. And what did you think as a group? What, did, what was the conversation with your breakout? Well, Adrian and I thought that while they, they're, there is a model right here. Um, I don't think it, they really created a model or developed a model. Because the understanding of developing a model is out of your own understanding, you develop, you create your own model. But this one, go to the internet, Google something, and you will see tons of this. So literally, so I, I, I don't know if this is still makes sense because if you go to the cast questions, it does not tell you what's the mitochondria. Where do you find the mitochondria? Those are not the kind of questions no more. So Yes, thank you. So there's, yeah, there's no, and I'm glad that you're referencing to the cast as well, because those questions are, you're thinking about the three-dimensional uh, assessments as the cast is is created. And so um, there was, there is not much of a sense making happening here, right? As you said, you can look it up and they're all going to be pretty much the same. And it's not student generated with their own ideas. Would anyone else like to add before we move on to the next, look at the next learning activity? Probably if you can, you can use this as a base of the project, but if you want to guide them, like have them this parts, but you also have what you call this, like what uh, Pedro said, maybe you can have a, a plant and animal cell, you see the differences. So for me, this is just base. So as a teacher, if you want this to make more sense, you have to guide them step by step, leading to that modeling, what Joy said a while ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Maria. Okay, so let's take a look at the next activity. Learning activity two. Anyone like to comment on this one? So in here, the students seem to be, um, they seem to provide explanations 
based on what they had seen, based on what they had heard or observed. So they were asked to make explanations, not really to create an argument, but just to offer an explanation. Right, yeah. Thank you, Joy. Yeah, so here's a specific learning activity uh, from the series of activities selected for a unit. And so you'll notice that, yeah, they are completing some kind of investigation, but then at the, towards the end, there is a question that says like, what, what makes, oh, let me make this a little larger and excuse the noise, but it says um, what, what this means and why did it change or not? And so now they're looking at thinking about how this activity is going to help them answer or support um, give them some more information about what happens in yeast that makes bread rise and why does the yeast do this. So they are um, going to be learning. There's a learning target. They're going to be able to infer that gas is the yeast that produces um, the gas. I'm sorry that the um, yeah, what what gas the yeast produces. And so um, this would be considered more of a learning activity where they're making sense and you know what their evidence they may be, may be gathering to include in that explanation about their phenomena. Next slide. So you might be wondering then, you know, what, what is sense-making? So what counts as a sense-making activity? And some examples include teacher demos, proof of concept demo, design a study, work with secondhand data, paper and pencil tasks simulating real data collection, computer simulations to produce data, station demos targeting same science concept, and of course, science theater. And what does not count as an activity? So here's a list of classroom activities that would not count as sense-making activities. And this list doesn't mean that these activities cannot happen in the classroom. This, each of these activities can be adapted to become a sense-making activity for students to explain big science ideas. So for example, a validation lab, it's, this is an activity in which the teacher has presented the full explanation of some principle and the students can simply count and ca carry out the investigation and, and kind of confirm like, voila, this is, it just happened um, just the way the teacher said. So it's a validation lab. The discover, discovery lab is where teachers have so little structure that they expect the students to stumble upon the same explanation for a phenomenon that has taken scientists years to formulate. So again, these could be um, possibly adapted, but again, the main focus is um, what is the purpose of this lesson and how will this help students in um, gathering more um, evidence or further, expla uh, further explanations about that phenomenon. Any questions or comments? Okay, next slide. And so here are two important terms that we will be reflecting upon as we continue with our work today. And the first is material work. Material work is defined as the portion of an activity that is more hands-on like setting up a lab, equip, setting up lab equipment. Um, but in this case, we wanna try and plan ways that we, you know, it is important for students to learn how to set up a lab and do things like that, but we want them to be more engaged in intellectual work. So finding, um, finding those shortcuts where there is the hands-on, but the, the, the time that is dedicated um, to learning and versus the setting up is the part that's the most important. So giving them the opportunity for the intellectual work. So it's defined as an activity in which students are working toward making meaning of an idea, an observation, or a phenomenon. So both of, they are important, they both are hand in hand, but we want to make sure that th that material work is more limited, where students are, again, more focused on the intellectual part where they're gathering that evidence and that sense making. And so again, it's important to remember that our main objective is supporting uh, changes in students' thinking over time. And so in order to do so, we must engage students in meaningful activities to help them understand parts of an anchoring phenomenon and engage with science, with science um, big ideas multiple times throughout the unit. 
So this is not a one and done kind of a lesson, but rather a series of lessons that help build understanding. Okay, so at this time, there's uh, opportunity for reflection and, um, and facilitation. So think about what are some key points you would want to highlight in this last portion that was presented. So when you present to your teachers, to your uh, faculty or colleagues, what would be some key points you would want to highlight and consider what could be some logistical or planning issues to consider and then also any possible teacher responses or potential challenges. So we will go back into our breakout rooms for for about four minutes and um, we'll see you in a bit. And our focus again is the Ambitious Science Teaching Practice 3. And um, the three sub practices within the practice are ideas to reason with, engaging, engaging with data or observations, and also using knowledge to revise models and explanations. So in the first part, this is the, um, this first area is um, ideas to reason with. And so in order for students to make sense of an activity, they need ideas to reason with as they do the activity. So this does not mean that the activity is designed to simply confirm what the teacher has told them. And so here the teacher would present certain ideas, uh, maybe some key concepts that they can utilize when their discussion as they are uh, completing their activity and making sense of it. And so, um, this is, um, there are several things that can be done to prepare for giving students the ideas to reason with. You can you know, plan for an, a 10 to 15 minute instruction, verbally link previous work and, need, and the need to know um, the new idea, and be ex explicit with the vocabulary, but do not give too much. So again, you're just giving a, a small enough chunk that they can work with as they, as they work through their activity and then give them those opportunities for sense making and make those connections. And you can present two different representations of the same concept and have students make connections. You want to avoid pronouns, do some check-in questions, incorporate time to ask what is puzzling you and what do you think you still need to know about the phenomenon. And then immediately after a presentation, you introduce that activity. So in engaging with data or observations, um, once students are looking at their data, you would suggest that the teachers do like a, two rounds of visiting the small group discussions. And so in the first round, you're, or they say the first lap, you're um, having students discuss what are you seeing here? And you wanna prepare um, some back pocket questions that you can ask them to guide them in their thinking without giving them the answer or saying, you know, that's correct or that's right. So you wanna visit small groups and guide their thinking and even provide them some of those questions, even maybe something to, a question to think about um, before, um, before moving on. And then in the lab two, in the second round that you visit your, your groups as they're discussing, you have them talk about, you know, can you explain how this activity helps you understand your anchoring phenomena? And so this, this second round is for you to kind of make an assessment of whether your students have an idea, a uh, better understanding of how the activity connects to that big idea. And so as you circu circulate, you should be identifying for yourself any groups that have unique ideas or parts of an explanation. And these students can be asked to share their ideas with the whole class in the, in the next few minutes. And so after you have those um, that you circulated around your, your class, you would um, have a whole group interaction and you have students talk about, you know, what do you think we know now about this engage this anchoring phenomenon? And so this is where teachers can help students see the broad trends or patterns of data for different groups in the classroom. And so then following this, students can, again, have an opportunity to revise, consolidate an explanation checklist. They can use post-it notes to think about what areas they might you know, want to change or add. And then as a teacher, you could cite a list of possible, um, with the class, possible hypotheses for the anchoring event and ask the whole class, which of these do you think we now know more? More, we now more likely is the correct answer or guiding you towards that hypothesis that's 
based on that evidence that they've gathered in sense making, which one might be more likely? And so here's a, here's a tool, an example of a digital summary table that can be used to track learning um, as sense-making activities are completed. And so summary tables can be adapted as necessary to meet the needs of the students. And so you notice you would start off with your unit level phenomenon. You would have, what did we do in sense-making? And then what SEP did students engage in during the activity? What did we learn? What observations and patterns did we observe? And then also what, how did it, how does it help us explain the phenomenon? And then also you can even cite key vocabulary, key ideas that, um, that students learned through that activity. And so here's a link to a anchoring phenomena table. As a sample, and you'll be taking a look at it later today as well as you uh, work on do some planning of it in this during this PD time. So that brings us to our facilitation notes. And so think about again what are some key points you would want to highlight? Maybe some what logistical planning issues as you present to your um, to your colleagues and teachers. And then what are some possible teacher responses or challenges to consider when planning for? this activity. And we'll be in breakout rooms again for four minutes. We'll see you back soon. Welcome back. We are going to continue with the PD about looking at anchoring phenomenon and sense-making activities and how they connect to help our students connect the learning that they're doing. So earlier you saw a sense-making activity connected to this question about what happens in yeast that makes bread rise and why does the yeast do this? So we're trying to see how the sense-making activity fits into the unit and really look at some pictures, student work, and use and see how they use their prior knowledge to form an explanation. So here is um, where the students would start by developing an, 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 an initial model. So students will focus on why this one loaf of bread was able to get fluffy and why the other did not get so fluffy. Students will write explanations of their models as well. And some of them may have the prior knowledge and background to connect their learning here, and some may not. So this, this is just their initial thinking. Um, we wanna see where they're coming from, what they think about it, um, and then move from there. So earlier we looked at the sense-making activity, right? They are given steps and directions on what to do but then they're also asked to analyze that information, right? What happened before, what happened after, and what does this mean? Why did it change or not change? Um, we're connecting it back to the anchoring phenomenon. Why does the yeast do this? And we're talking about the learning target, their evidence, the key learning that they're going to be doing, and the connection to explain this part of the phenomenon. So, this makes this a sense-making activity because they truly are trying to understand what is happening in this process through this lab and how it connects to that anchoring phenomenon again. Um, it's not disjointed, it's not a separate one and done lab, but it's connecting to what's happening and they always are coming back to answering that question together. So then for our students, we want to support their constructing and understanding of this knowledge, their skills. So we can use a uh, summary table. So earlier you saw summary tables that kind of looked like this. That's maybe for us as teachers to keep track of the learning that we want to present to our students, help us with the planning. But for our students themselves, they may need to see an actual chart. They may need to see something physical in the classroom to go back and refer to the information, everything that they've learned and built on. So here's what they did, right? That's the activity, the sense-making activity. 
what did they learn from that activity and how does it connect back to the anchoring phenomenon of what, what happens in the yeast that makes the bread rise and why does the yeast do this? So as you go through each of these learning activities, we're building up and we're providing, providing a visual for the kids to come back and to add on and to understand um, a tracker. So not just something that's in my own lesson plan, my own lesson book, but something for the kids themselves to see and remind them because then they can go back and physically go, oh yeah, that's what we learned. Oh yeah, that's how it connected. So then at the end, we want students to be able to finish up with the final model. So you're gonna see some examples of the students uh, participating in their explanations, their, their final gapless explanations of what they believe and what they uh, know based on the information and investigative sense-making activities that they've done. So then since we as the teachers have carefully selected these activities and adapted them to help students make sense of why some of the bread rises and why some doesn't, don't, then they're able to use their learning to develop new models and answering the, answer the anchoring question for that unit. So now you're getting details as to, okay, this is what's happening, right? We have some directions on what they're supposed to do. They're giving, details on maybe at the molecular level, what's happening to the atoms and the molecules. They're explaining, they're, sh they're showing and telling the evidence of what's happening. So you see like zooming in on certain things. So just like we referred, I'm gonna come back to the previous slide, to this kind of unit chart phenomenon tracker. What you might see is also, uh, this as a sort of map. It's a summary of the sequencing that we want to do as we plan for our students' learning. So each activity in this unit, right, is a piece of one of, is a piece of the sense-making puzzle. So students can use all of these pieces at the end and at the middle to then explain the phenomenon. So here's the question that, that, that is investigative. Here's the phenomena related to it. Here's what they're going to do, figure out. And then they're adding and building up. So it's just another sort of sense-making map storyline for you to visualize with. Um, so here are just some of the tasks and activities that students would have done to build on that. And they're always, remember, coming back to revising. Revising, adding on, now explaining in detail. So. You've seen this again. What we're going to uh, give you time for right now is to plan. So now is your opportunity to plan within your content. Um, think about the unit that you are on. You could be planning for what you are on now or what you will do or maybe what you'll do. Um, you've already done, but you want to <laughs> replan for the next school year. Um, think about what is that unit level phenomenon? What are the sense-making activities that are going to build on to help them answer that question? What science and engineering practices will they engage in as they do these activities? What are they supposed to learn through each of these? And how will it help the students explain the unit level phenomenon? Maybe there are key vocabulary terms to include here. And um, I think Pedro was mentioning this, mentioning this earlier too. Some of the questions that the students are generating, right? If you already anticipate some of these questions that students are going to generate um, or what would like them to generate, that's where you might want to add in, add into each of these specific sense-making activities. So if, if there's a, a set of questions that you know that students might be interested in, okay, well, how do I engage them in answering those questions within the sense-making activity? How can I help them connect those things together? And, and how will it build up to help us explain that phenomenon? Um, this is kind of a quick, simple tracking table. We're also going to give you a link to this um, tool. It's similar in the sense that it's helping us track and key and it's actually a little more detailed, obviously, 
because this will be specific to each sense making activity. So you might have the previous one to help you track each one individually, right, as a general idea. But then for this one, you could use this practice tool to then zoom in on one particular sense making activity and think about some of the questions you'll pose for discourse, what your students might, uh, how they might respond, and then how you could reflect on it afterwards. So that link is um, also in the chat for you to use and to build on. So there are kind of two layers to these tools. Um, so we're gonna give you about 20, 20, 25 minutes, Lillian, does that sound good? So we're gonna yeah. give you 20 to 25 minutes um, within your content areas, hopefully, to plan out, to organize, to think about your sense-making activity, and um, really get into it. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and open them up. So hopefully you had a chance to just kind of start planning out and tracking your sense-making activities, your unit level phenomenon. Um, this is, again, just a basic way for us to keep track, to see what are some activities, what are the learnings that our students may, be, may need to do. Um, and, and how you can really bring this back in. So we know that there are, there are difficulties, there are things that come up but really something um, that I was trying to share with one of our groups is, you know, how can we still have our students make sense of what they're learning and doing, even though we have to deal with a lot of other issues and situations, right? Because we may need to go back to the basics. We may need to spend a little longer on a unit or a phenomenon, but we can still help our students make sense of those things. Um, so thinking about those high leverage pieces, thinking about uh, cast, what are the parts within cast that we really need to focus on? And maybe that's where we, that we, that's where we go and stay, start. Um, so this is uh, towards the end, we're just gonna kind of wrap up our PD soon. Um, so thinking about the parts of today's PD that were the most valuable to you as a learner, um, what parts of today's PD were the highest leverage pieces, again, in supporting your science department in this NGSS teaching and learning? And what will your next steps be to implement those parts in your department? So thinking of yourselves as the facilitators now, um, how will we bring this to our teachers and our staff? Um, what, are, what are the things in today's PD that would be the highest leverage? So we can just go ahead and unmute and share. You make a, a point about, you know, not all of the teachers, this is gonna stick with them at, from the beginning. And some teachers need more exposure um, to understand or to be willing to try. But if you're trying it yourselves as the science leaders at your schools, and then you're saying, this is how it can be used and you can show them um, how it can be effective, there's a little more buy-in um, and you are kind of our, our pathways into just that ambitious science teaching, right? Uh, guiding your science teachers and leaders to be able to do this. So we thank you so very, very much for your time. Um, we are going to place a link in the chat for the evaluation. So go ahead and complete that for us. Um, while you do that, if you did not already know, we have our STEAM Fest coming up in a, in a week on Saturday, March 5th. Um, the link will be in the chat as well. Uh, the sign up to, if you want to have a booth, present an activity, um, an engaging activity that you can do with the students that are coming, uh, you do need to sign up by Monday. And that link is also part of the, that sign up is also part of the link. Um, but if you have students at your school and, and families who just want to come and participate, they can totally come and do that as well. They don't necessarily have to sign, sign up for it, although there is an option on the sign up for it. 
um, they can just come and participate. So please, please uh, join us. We'll be there. We'll hopefully we can see you in person <laughs> instead of just these little rectangular screens. Um, and take a moment to also fill out our evaluation link. Um, this again is our STEAM team. So you had me and Lillian here today. Um, we serve different communities, but you can contact any of us here listed. You all know Craig. <laughs> um, you can contact any of us with any questions, concerns, um, or even if you need additional you know, links, things to tools um, that we've been sharing, ideas for how to do, uh, share these PDs. We're going to place a, links to this main deck as well as the participant slide deck so that you can use these to share with your staff. Lillian, do you have it? Should I do it? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Yeah, there it is. So there'll be forced copies for you to hold on to and keep, and then you can revise and edit as needed. Um, that could, that's another logistical thing that we've been talking about, you know, on those, those, those uh, lavender slides is maybe you don't get the full hour or two hours for a PD. Like, how do you tweak these to be digestible for your staff, for your teachers? Um, thinking of ways to present the tools that we're sharing with you too. What are those high leverage pieces within each of these PDs to help you with that? Um, so we're going to give you a couple more minutes to work on the evaluation. We really do appreciate your feedback. 